Listen to the vibes hosted by Coyote Night. Listen in for some positivity and good times. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Marshall, Will and Holly On the routine expedition Met the greatest earthquake ever known High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft ah! and plunged them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Listen to the Vibes. I have here Mr. Wesley Ure. How are you today, sir? I am excellent. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, man, I can't thank you enough because you were a big part of my childhood. Um, Saturday mornings, Land of the Lost. I mean, that was television for me. Yeah, Run, Holly, run. There's a dinosaur. <laughs> That's my entire performance for all those years on Land of the Lost. <laughs> of course, you know, here I am, an old man with, with my dolls. I've got Enoch here from Land of the Lost, and, and I've got Cassie from Dragon Tales, which is a show that I helped create. But uh, yeah, Land of the Lost, it's been amazing. It just celebrated its 45th anniversary, 45 wow. years ago. You, I mean, who knew that when we were filming that show that 45 years ago, we'd still be talking about it. And it's still on the air. I mean, it just came back on the air on, on, on one of the channels, I think Tubi or something like that recently. It's been on uh, Netflix, it's been on PBS, it's, you know, it, it just keeps re rebubbling up, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> like that's, the clan as well. <laughs> but, that's awesome, though. I mean, <laughs> the kids should be exposed to those things, because, I mean, Saturday mornings were was special when, when I was a kid, you know? I'd get up early, about six o'clock in the morning, I think the day started with Alvin and the Chipmunks, and then, you know, I can't I can't even name all of them I used to watch but I mean all the Sid and Marty Croft shows stuff in Lidsville and you know there was Run Joe Run there was Shazam with Michael Gray yes. you know I mean, it was back in the day it was like it was like a big event Saturday was was kids day you know parents would sleep in you'd grab your bowl of cereal you'd sit in front of the TV and you'd watch until you know 11:30 noon and then you know that was it but you know you you looked forward to it Oh, exactly. Oh, I remember when we used to get the TV guide in the mail and I would run and I'd go get it and I'd map out what I was going to watch for Saturday morning. <laughs> it's true. We had, you know, because we, uh, Kathy Coleman, who played Holly, mm -hmm. and Phil Paley, who played Chaka, the, the monkey boy, we do a lot of shows together, these autograph shows like Comic Cons and things like that. And it's amazing how many people we have come up to our table and talk to us. Um, how much it meant to them because, you know, Land of the Lost wasn't, a, it was written by the Star Trek writers. David Gerald was a head writer. He wrote Trouble with Tribbles, if you're a, if you're a Trekkie. Yes, Walter I Koenig, Walter Koenig, who played Chekhov in the original Star Trek, created this character, Enoch. I did not know that. I see Walter, Kathy and I do the Star Trek convention at the Rio in Vegas every year. And Walter, of course, is there signing autographs. And he has his little hat on and he comes shuffling over and he goes, those damn crofts! I should have got residuals on Enoch. I should have got residuals. <laughs> well, he he did a Saturday morning show too, didn't he? Walter? Yeah, I think he did. I I I, I don't remember. I'm, I don't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. It was like I don't remember if it was Jason the Star Command or something like that. But it was one of those uh, Saturday morning shows. But wow. That's that's another show in itself. It is. When people come up to our table, it, 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 it's startling sometimes. We had um, one guy, uh, he's in his 50s now because he used to watch Land of the Lost, and he said that he sort of was crying. And we said, are you okay? He said, let me tell you something. He says, I don't mean to be kind of like creepy here. He said, but after the second season of Land of the Lost and to the third season, we lost our dad and our uncle came in. He said, my mom and dad were getting a divorce. Mm -hmm. And he said, I didn't know how I was going to survive this. He said, I was devastated. I, 
I couldn't stop crying. I, I didn't know what to do. He said, but I saw in Land of the Lost, I watched you how you were able to transition without your father and move on and have a life. And he said, it helped me get through that time. And we we're like hugging him. And, you know, it, it's amazing. One, one girl from Compton, which was a really, really bad area, especially back in the 70s in Los Angeles. She said it was so dangerous in my neighborhood that we'd watch Land of the Lost in the morning and my mom wouldn't let us go out and play. She was scared. So we would play Land of the Lost the entire weekend, hiding, making caves and running around with Lee Stack and, and stuff like that. And we have, we have so many stories. There was, a, there, were, there was one guy that came up to our table in Los Angeles at a show and he said, listen, I'm from Iraq and I thought you guys spoke Farsi because it was dubbed back in the day into Farsi. And he said, Land of the Lost, because the sci-fi and all the writers, he said, I became interested in science. And he and his brother became two of the heads of Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And he said, we'd like to give you a private tour of JPL. So Kathy and I went and because of Land of the Lost, they let us into every nook and cranny of JPL. We even went into the room, this huge room, imagine this room, there's tons of computers, one guy, sitting there with a joystick and a computer monitor, and he's programming the rover on Mars for the next day. And they let us come into this room, you have to go through security, and they let, they let us play with the joystick, you know, driving Mars. And this guy had, had a uh, driver's license for every rover he'd, he'd driven, the only guy that had ever driven all the, the, the rovers that had ever been to Mars. And I mean, of course, when we played the joystick, it didn't move the rover because they program it, put it on the computer, test it out and then they send it to Mars and it takes eight hours for the signal to get there and then the rover moves. So, but we got to play with the joystick and pretend we were moving it. But it's, it's amazing uh, the effect of this little show. I mean, it was a Saturday morning show, you know, uh, a cheap little budget and, but written by some of the greatest science fiction writers like DC Fontana and Larry Niven, all these people that back in the day, they were at the beginning of their careers, so you could afford them. And, you know, a few years later, they were the number one sci-fi writers, and you couldn't afford them. So. Well, you know, for, for people like me, I didn't have a whole lot of friends, you know, in my neighborhood. And, and um, you know, it, it, was, it got a little rougher as the older I got. But, I mean, Saturday mornings was an escape. And to have shows like yours and, like you mentioned, Shazam!, um, all these different shows, they, they impacted us in, in a certain way. And you don't want to sound like, you know, like that guy said, a creep or, you know, like this, oh, I'm a crazy fanboy or something, but these shows really meant a lot to us. You know, this was, this was another world. So, and I, unfortunately the kids nowadays, it seems like they have a, a 30 minute commercial for a cartoon or whatever. So well, also, also back then, you know, it was children's programming was regulated. And, you know, most of the, because when I created Dragon Tales, which ran from 2000 to 2009 on PBS, um, it, it was unlike the other shows at the time for kids too, because most every kid's show was, it was a smart aleck, young white kid putting down the parents, was smarter than the parents. And insult, it was all about insults and about, you know, hurting somebody and things like that. And Land of the Lost, you know, the reason it held up so long, it was, you know, we were a family, uh, our father and our sister, Holly, and, and we were trapped in a world with dinosaurs. We, we had lost our mother and there was a family group that held the show together. Mm -hmm. And it touched, it touched on a lot of issues that weren't touched on. And the scripts, you know, never talked down to kids. It's like the science fiction was, if you watch it, I mean, the, the, effect, the special effects look hokey now because it was state of the art at the time, but now come on, we have CGI and stuff. But it talked about uh, time doorways and matrices and and doppelgangers and paradigms, and it was it, it it explored a lot of issues, but it never had to explain it to the kids. The kids had to learn what it meant each week, and that's one of the reasons that the kids were so I think fascinated by it. Well, I still remember the slee stack would make my anxiety go high. I was scared of those things. Yeah. <laughs> I get so the slee stack came out, I think, the second or third episode, and the ratings went off the charts. It, it was NBC's number one show. And the slee stack, I don't know if, it, if you know this, but uh, they were all basketball players at UCLA. They were the kids in college. They were seven feet tall, each of them. So they're seven feet tall, barefoot, 
They've got a stilt on with the pointed claws on the feet. They've got a pointed head like, like Enoch here, but went up. So they're about 10 feet tall in person. So all these guys were basketball players and one in particular, Bill Lambeer of the Detroit Pistons, who became the bad boy of basketball and is now the coach for the, I think the Aces, the, the women's team in Las Vegas, was a slee stack. No kidding. No kidding. And recently, Kathy and I were in Las Vegas for the Star Trek convention, and we went and surprised Bill. He was coaching the ladies' team. And when we walked in, the owner of the team had he didn't tell him we were coming, but all the, all the women knew. And they had a, an 8 by 10 of a slee stack. As soon as we walked in, they pulled it out and held it above their faces. And, he, you know, he's like this, this Bill Lambert, Detroit Christian, and stuff like that. And, and the owner said to me, he said, I have never seen Bill smile that much. So I've got a picture and I look like, I look about this tall, <laughs> this tall. I mean, I'm not the tallest guy in the world anyway, but it was, it's, 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 it's almost cartoonish. But it, you know, it, it, it's amazing how, what went on for people in, in the careers after the show. So. So like, and your, your dad on the show was Rick. Yeah, Rick Marshall. Okay, but the song goes Marshall, Will, and Holly. I know. Now I sang that song. I sang. <laughs> I sang the theme songs. The the uh, yeah, Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft. Ah! Uh. <laughs> Plunged them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost, 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 to the land of the lost. And then Grumpy died and sort of, Rawr. But and it was, yeah, it was Marshall, Will, and Holly, not Rick Marshall, Will, and Holly. Yeah, it was, it was I remember the show was so low budget, I think that they wrote it so fast that they, they probably didn't even, it didn't even dawn on them. But in the third season, when we lost our dad, I had to go back in the studio with Michael Lloyd and re-record the theme song because it, it didn't make sense anymore for the third season. And it was, it went, uh, uh... <laughs> welcome to the COVID world. We have deliveries coming. <laughs> I love I it. Yeah. Uh, so the third season, it was uh, 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 Will and Holly Marshall, as the earth beneath them trembled, lost their father through the door of time. Uncle Jack was searching and found the kids at last, looking for a way to escape, escape, escape from the land of the lost, the land of the lost. But my favorite is the closing theme song. And so many rock and roll stars, like, uh, well, Tenacious D, Jack Black, have yep. done covers of this song. It's, when I look all around, I can't believe the things i found. Now I need to find my way. I'm lost, I'm lost, find me living. In the land of the lost, 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 <laughs> living in the land of the lost, <laughs> Sid Marty Croft. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, and you are an accomplished musician as well. Well, I, I used to sing. I used to open for Bill, for Bill Cosby at Harris in Lake Tahoe in Vegas. But, uh, I, and it was fun because, uh, you know, back in, in the day, I, 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 it's like, <laughs> I love to these shows. It's all about me, 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 me. I apologize. But we, I sang in the third season and I had this like four string guitar, or like a gourd, but it sounded like an orchestra. It was magic. But I'd go to the Jacksons, the homes of the Jacksons. They wrote all the songs. I would go to their house. They had an apartment house in Santa Monica next to the Mormon temple. And I would go to their Mormon temple and uh, across the street and we would record these little one minute ditties that we had. And uh, what was so bizarre, though, I got to tell you, is they didn't have switch plates on their lights. I thought, I thought, these people are rich. What the heck's going on? I don't understand. They, didn't, they were like just open switches and stuff like that. I'm going, why don't they finish this? This is an apartment building. <laughs> anyway, they were terrific guys. And <laughs> back, because back in the day, all the, all the guys and gals that were, you know, there were teen idols on 16 Magazine and Tiger Beat and covers we did like Michael Gray and uh, David Cassidy and all these different people, we hung out. You know, Sean Cassidy and Leif uh, Garrett used to come to my house and swim back, you know, back when we were young and pretty. But, uh, you know, so it's just a different world back then. Uh, speaking of Leif Garrett, we went to the Antique Mall 
in the city next to ours and they had a leaf garrett album and i almost bought it <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> in fact i gotta show you this real quick so give yeah, me yeah, please i gotta show you what i did get so i don't know about you but i was like really big into happy days back in the in the day yep i found this Ah, oh, the Fonz, yay! Fonzie yeah. favorites. And I always remember this because my original album did this too. You could, you know, make a, make it like a picture frame and set it up. And I'm like, oh, I, I gotta know. have it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Those guys, we, we filmed at General Services, uh, which was the old Charlie Chaplin studio in Los Angeles. And Happy Days was filming next to us. So we got to see these guys and, and back in the day, you know, running around and things like that. Then we moved to Goldwyn Studios uh, later on. But yeah, I mean, uh, and boy, Henry Winkler sure has made a career for himself. Unbelievable as, as an actor, as a director, producer. He's, you know, and I hear really nice things about him. I don't know him yet. I mean, I, I saw him on the set years ago when we were all starting out, but you know, who knew what would happen with Ronnie Howard and all these amazing careers that took off. You know, I, was on, I was on Days of Our Lives at the same time. I did Days of Our Lives for about a decade, played Mike Horton. And Deidre Hall, who's one of the stars of Days of Our Lives, she was starring in Dinah Girl Electro. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. on the set of Land Loss one day. I'm outside. She comes over to me. I've never met her before. She says, I'm Deidre. I'm doing the show here with the cross. And she says, I've got an audition for Days of Our Lives. And I know you're on the show. And I said, Deidre, I know what they're looking for. So she had her sides, which are the script that she had to learn for the, the audition. And we worked on it. And not that I helped her get the show or anything like that because she's certainly talented but she got the part and to this day she's the grand dam still of days of our lives and uh, and, and she's a, just a delight so that's yeah it's just all these <laughs> intertwining yeah, yeah exactly it's like yeah okay <laughs> and so and you you you're an author you direct produce all these things i mean tell us about all your projects oh my god Kyle, this is, <laughs> this is this is a Wesley explosion day. <laughs> hey, this is all sure? about you, man. Sure. Oh God, I have five books I've written. One book, Disney Option for an animated feature. It's called The Red Wings of Christmas. It's a, uh, and I wrote the screenplay of the songs for Disney. It's been sitting on the shelf, but they optioned it, and it's it's available on Kindle on, on Amazon, for the holidays. I have a lot of schools that use it, and uh, they read it. It's a chapter book. They read a chapter after Thanksgiving until Christmas and yeah I mean I have kids books and dragon tales and I've got a new show I just sold as an executive producer of a reality show which I can't talk about yet because they won't let me but uh, we'll be announcing hopefully within the next few weeks we'll go into production it's been two years in the making of this show and I do a lot of charity work we raise a lot of money for um, shelter from the storm battered women uh, breast cancer AIDS uh, I produce big shows with celebrity shows and we, you know, we raise a lot of money and it, you know, it's, it, that's, that's my giving back. I, I don't, listen, I am so blessed. I, I don't take any of this for granted. I, I'm a little kid from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I didn't have anybody in the, in the business. There was nobody, you know, they, I announced when I was five years old, I'm going to be an actor. And they go, <laughs> crazy kid, yeah. get out of our family. And, um, and so it, it was, you know, I, I, I am so lucky that to have had what I've had. You know, we all sometimes want more, uh, but I, a day doesn't go by that I don't look around what my house and, you know, what I, my friends and my life and just go, wow, what a journey. And it's, it's you know, gratitude. I live, I live in gratitude a lot. You know, I remember when The Secret came out, the book about The Secret, and uh, and it was this big hoopla about it, and the secret was <laughs> oh, <laughs> but the big secret, you know, it's gratitude, being great. And I go, oh, duh, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, that's what I mean. I literally, and I don't, not, not, I would, Pollyanna is my spiritual leader. That's my religion. Here's a girl that walked into a family that hated each other for decades. In two weeks, they all loved each other and were hugging and kissing. How much better could you be? You know, that, so that's, that's how I live my life. And 
I, you know, and I, and I try to give back as much as I can. Well, you know, I, I do a daily devotional and one of the things I emphasize on is that gratitude changes your attitude and people would just stop and, you know, every morning I tell everybody, you, you get up and either you think it in your head, you say it out loud or even better, write it down all the things that you're thankful for and, you know, look around at what you do have. And when you're grateful for what you already have, then you make room for new things to come into your life. I 100% agree. You know, I, 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 I years ago in the, uh, in the early 80s, I, I left Hollywood and I backpacked around the world and I moved to Bali. But, you know, we, I thumbed through Iran and Iraq and had knife fights in, um, in uh, Rangoon and the Irrawaddy River on, a, you know, the first uh, white people to, to be allowed back in, in, in Burma in, in two decades and, you know, had slept in barnyards in India and, and all sorts of stuff and really lived the life. And because I kept going, there's got to be something better than this. I mean, I, I was having a lot of success and, but there was a lot going on in life that was pretty sad. And I thought, you know, what, what is this really all about? And I said, I'm going to go on a journey. <laughs> all I could think of was Bali High, <laughs> that whole musical. It was I mean, it had nothing to do with Bali, but, but I, I thought, okay, Bali, I'll go to Bali. And I began this journey, flew to Brussels and made my way through Greece and all the land and, you know, uh, through Iraq and Pakistan. And, oh, my God, the stories we had of... <sighs> Riding on back of cement trucks and hitchhiking in Pakistan. You couldn't do that now. It's, it, it's too dangerous. The world is dangerous. But it, it, it certainly opened my, my eyes. And when I, I Disney bought my book while I was gone, and there was no cell phones or things back then, it's the early 80s. And I told Disney I was leaving before, and, and I said, I'm not coming back. If you want me to write something, I'll, I have to do it from Bali. Well, we, it, it wouldn't work. The phones, you had, to, you had to go to the post office, wait in line, get, a, get a, a line out and talk for a little bit of time. And they said, look, if you want, your, you want us to do your movie, you better come back. So I came back. And, and, and the Red Wings at Christmas, when I wrote the Red Wings at Christmas, um, I, I had a meeting at Disney. Um, and... Uh, Disney's brother came up to me and he said, Wesley, your book is the most spiritual book I've ever read. And I was like, thank you. I mean, it's, you know, the Red Wings of Christmas, it's the story of, uh, of a little boy in the 1850s. His name is Albert. And as a baby, he's washed overboard in a wooden cradle in a storm, a boat heading to America, a giant hand of a wave lifts up the cradle and washes him to the Thames River. And he's found by an old washerwoman named Tezariah. And he's raised by her until one night, everything, it's very Dickensian, everything dark happens. He loses Tezzy, there's, but there's a, there's Mr. Lacey's toy emporium that has been his joy, look in the window and the jack in the box. And one night he finds he's all alone, he's lost everything, he's a street kid called a mudlark. And they were kids back in the day and in England in the, in the 1800s that would scavenge the Tim River, Tim's River for coal or anything driftwood, that, anything they could sell, and they sank. And so this night, when he loses everything, he's distraught, he's eight years old. He's under the, uh, one of the bridges and something falls on him, this cloth. And it ends up to be Father Christmas's toy sack that had fallen out of a, a sleigh. And he crawls inside and he begins to fall and tumble. And he enters this world where no child has ever been. It's a place where every broken toy goes. Because every toy that's ever been made, no toy has ever died. Every toy, because uh, a broken toy can be loved and played with, but as soon as that toy is not to be loved or played with, its heart comes out and breaks in half because it's sad. And the two halves begin to circle the toy, light on the back of the toy and begin to unfurl and become these large red wings of Christmas. And they fly every broken toy into Father Christmas's toy sack. The wings are released, the heart comes back, and they enter this infinite world where they're repaired, made ready, modernized, whatever it takes to find a new home. And it's Albert's, this little boy's journey in this world that he should not be and what happened.
Oh, yeah. You know, uh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't oh, no, no, please, please go ahead. Uh, I was just say, in a world with so much negativity going on, it's nice to see people trying to bring some positive things and, and you know, especially something where you see a, a kid that has lost everything and then going through this journey. Well, it, when I, when I, I, I wrote, oh, I'm going to cry. I, I wrote the book <laughs> and um, when I wrote the book, I, um, I, my, I gave this, the, my sister said, Here, here's a, something I'm working on. She read it, goes, Wesley, it's you. I go, no, no, it's so Albert, it, Wesley, it's you. And, um, and I reread it again. Oh, a delivery coming back from, <laughs> from COVID. <laughs> well, thank you, Amazon. Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, FedEx. I appreciate it. But when I wrote, I read, I wrote this book and, and I read it and I, I realized that he, my dad left when I was two. He, he abandoned our family. And these were very educated people. And he never came back. And I was set free in this world that I didn't belong in. It was all women. I had no men in my life. Um, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, I went to Texas for a while. Um, and I just, it was, it was me searching. For it. And I realized, yeah, it, it was. It, it was about me. And I dedicated the book to my friend John Allison, uh, who passed away, was a, a director from England. And he had died of AIDS in the, uh, one of the first to go in the early 80s. And I did, you know, and he had, he had given me the inspiration for, for, for the mudlarks in England and, and bringing it to that, that kind of sensibility and, uh, and his journey, finding the red wings of his life and flying away to wherever he was going to go and, and he began anew. He was, was, was dedicated the book to. He was my best friend at the time. So um, it's, it's interesting. You write something and you don't really realize what you're writing. Because obviously we write our experiences in a, in a, even if it's a, a totally animated sort of uh, fanciful, fictional place. Turns out it's not so fictional. You know, it, it would have been very easy for somebody <laughs> like you. Oops, excuse me, I'm getting an echo there. Um, for, you know, you've had something tragic happen in your life and just to take that negative road, but yet you've brought so much joy into this world. I mean, like I said, my, my childhood getting to watch Land of the Lost and, and of course my mother and her soap operas, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, Disney, the, the, the dragon tales and, and, you know, plus you did the game show on Nickelodeon and it, you just keep bringing more and more joy back into the world and you know you should, there should be more people like you no I, I pre I listen thanks you know I lecture I, I lecture uh, at schools schools have me come in and I, I teach kids how to write books and stuff like that I have a within an hour an entire auditorium of kids we write a book and illustrate it in one hour and um, but I it, Dragon Tales uh, has w was an interesting journey because it went on the air and, and uh, you know, and now I, we do some shows and, and a lot of kids that are in their 20s, but we have a lot of kids that are on the spectrum. Ah, oh, they come to the table and they know every lyric and they see Cassie and the dolls, uh, uh, the two-headed dragon, Zack and Wheezy and, and Ord and the different characters that were there. And the excitement I have one, one young man that I speak to, he's from, he lives in Texas, and uh, Zach, and I can talk about him because his mom lets me, who, uh, who I call, he's in the hospital a lot, and he's ill, and, uh, and we sing the theme song to Dragon Tales all the time, and, and you know, it, it, it's, you just, again, you never know what you create, how it's gonna affect or ripple out into the world, and I've been, lucky that uh, some of the things that I created, you know, have a positive spin that, that do bring joy. And that, you know, of course with Dragon Tales was PBS. And of course the edict from PD PBS was to create a show that a positive, a learning show. And I remember I, I got a phone call that 
the executive producer at Sony Pictures had his son's favorite book was The Red Wings of Christmas, the book I'd written. He said, Wesley, I've got these dragon drawings. You gotta come see these dragon drawings. And I think you could write something. There's a, uh, the US government is offering $16 million for a new kid show. And, and, and Sesame Street wants it, and the Muppets want it, and everybody wants it. So I came and they had written some stuff. I rewrote, created, created Zack and Wheezy and the Two-Headed Dragon and stuff, and put it together in three days, and it sold in a week. And we beat everybody out. Um, wow. But it was, it's amazing how, that, how all these things, Enoch, all these things ripple effect. And, and I, you know, I, I don't take it for granted. I mean, I don't. I, I'm just very blessed. I mean, here I am talking to you. I mean, this, what, what, what a joy. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, it, you know, I, I wanted to have a show where people could come on and tell their story and be an inspiration for other people, you know, give them some extra motivation and positivity. And you, you exude that. I will say you. you really do. That's me sucking up. <coughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I, I really appreciate. It. I was wondering when you were going to get to sucking up. I thank you now for goddamn time. I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I, I I I ran across your your picture the other day, and I said I've I've got to I got to look him up because I mean, I guess I can't say enough how much you've been an influence on me, and um, and so I, I found your Instagram and I said, okay, I got to make sure this is the, the right guy. And then went to your website and, I, and, I, and so I said, I'm going to take a chance. And, um, and I wrote you an email and when you responded, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was elated. I'm like, oh, I can't believe it. He actually answered me, but you know, we need more positivity in this world. That's that I guess that's my point is we really do. There's, you know, everything you turn on the TV or on social media and YouTube, it's always something negative, you know, whether it's politics or, you know, whatever craziness is going on, but you don't get a whole lot of people just coming out and say, Hey, let's, let's try something positive for a change. You know, you can find a few, but it seems like everybody just wants to talk about what's bad going on in the world. I have a rule with my friends. First of all, on Facebook, I never post anything negative. I, th I thought there is enough of that. If I can't, I post nothing if there's nothing positive or fun or something, you know, to talk about. But my rule with my friends, because I'm getting old. I mean, I'm up there now, you know, I'm, I'm getting way up there. And um, my rule with my friends, because as you get older, everybody wants to talk about their ailments and their problems and this and that. And I said, look, here's the rule. We get together, you got 10 minutes. Go for it. Hospitals, medicines, you know, politics, the world. And then when that's over, the 10 minutes is over, then let's talk about, let's talk about art and life and, and travel and things like that. Let's, let's do this because you know what, otherwise it will suck the energy out of you. And it's like, you know, I, I now spend half of the year in Mexico I, um, in Puerto Vallarta. I, I have a house in Mexico now and I go there for, can't go this year because of the COVID and because it's, it's really bad there. The virus is really devastating in Mexico. And, but we go there and just the world stops. You know, it's going to the beach and having coffee all day. It's just, you know, it's just, it's doing nothing except happily doing nothing. <laughs> and, and having friends and laughing and giggling and singing and stuff like that. And, you know, and, and believe me, I am aware of the tragedies and I am acutely aware of the suffering of a lot of people I don't take it for, I mean, again, I, I, I get it. I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm not the ostrich with my head in the sand. I do what I can and, and whether it's fundraising or whatever it is, but then you gotta live a life too, because if, if there's no beacons out there of hope and happiness, then what, uh, I, I lost my stepdaughter uh, to cancer. She was 21. And she said to me before she died, she said, she was out doing stuff and, you know, she, there she was cancer and she, she was out there going to college and getting a double major and all that stuff and working when she got out of the hospital and said, I got to work. I went to Bank of America, got a job and going to Texas A&M and all this stuff. And um, she said, I go, you, you don't need to do this. And, you know, she said, 
what's the point of struggling to live life if there's no life to live afterwards? True. So that's touching. Really is. Uh, you know, people will sit here and want to go over, oh, this is going wrong in my life. I don't have this. I don't have that. But they don't stop and think about the other people in the world that have it even worse. And when you see somebody who, who knows they're not going to be here very much longer, but they still want to live their life, that should be an inspiration for those of us who do have a life to get out there and live it. Yeah. I, 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 when I backpacked around the world, uh, and really backpacked around. We weren't staying at the Hilton's <laughs> with dollar a night hotels if we could get them in Pakistan. Um, you see the other, you see what we have here. The worst case scenario here sometimes is the best case scenario in another country. And it doesn't minimize because everything, you know, everything's relative. I, each of our experiences are relative. You know, whatever you have is your experience and whatever, you know, somebody has more or less or whatever. It's, you know, it's relevant to you and it's relative. So, but when you see such an extreme like in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and things like that, um, I could not have been more grateful for my life. You know, I remember coming home, flying suddenly back to do this thing for Disney and I had been, you know, we'd been living off of $5 a day was our budget. And that was travel, food, and lodging. $5 with two of us. And I, I, my mother and my sister picked me up at the airport. I flown in, you know, I've been living in Bali. I fly in and they take me to Dupar's restaurant in Los Angeles at the old farmer's market, which is gone, I guess. And I look at the menu and I think like the, 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 the burger or something was like twelve ninety five, and I like I I froze. I just like, I I because my 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 mindset had been five dollars for my life every day, and twelve ninety I I I froze. And my mother said, Wesley, you're back in the states. Deal with it. You know, and I go, yeah, but it's twelve ninety five, and so everything you know is relative. And, and we've got to find common ground on this planet. We have to politically and everything we've got to. And uh, because at the end of the day, we are genetically and DNA, all brothers and sisters, all from the same sources, you know, the color of your skin or hair or whatever that is, it's just a very thin superficial thing that happened because of climate where you lived and whatever. But we're all, all of us brothers and sisters. And, and to, to separate ourselves from that is a very, it's a very lonely thing to do, and it's also a very dangerous thing to do, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, years ago, I had went to Monterey, Mexico, and we were on a uh, retreat, basically, for the church. We went to uh, we went to a church there where we had we've been supporting for years, and um, after we have our revival, we would go out and you know just hang out in the streets or whatever, and you know, I kept thinking, yeah, uh, yeah, I've got it so bad at home. But then I see these people with hardly nothing and I'm sitting there and I'm rubbing my eyes and I'm telling my wife, I said, I'm, my eyes are just burning. I don't know what's wrong. And all of a sudden this kid just darts past me and we're walking around and we're still talking. And this kid comes up and he brings me a bottle of Visine and runs off. And this kid had nothing, but yet the little bit he did have, he thought so much of us because we had come there as part of the church that, that he wanted to give back to us. Like, Oh my God, I don't, I don't have it as bad as I think I do. And here this kid has nothing. And he gave, he gave me what little bit he had just for me to be comfortable. Yeah. You, you know, when, when I say that I live in, in Puerto Vallarta, the visions are, Oh, Puerto Vallarta. I live in the hood in Puerto Vallarta, I have a house in with the drug dealers and i live in the with the local people i don't live i live close to the tourist area but my house is where you know the cartel they're selling stuff down down below i look at the three-story house and look down you know it's it's a real neighborhood and you know and it, I, it we 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 i because i learned the language and and you know we shop and I mean, I have my, my hoity-toity friends, trust me, and I've got all the, all the bells and whistles when I walk, you know, seven blocks towards the beach. But we live 
you know, in a, in a real world with chickens on the streets and dogs and horses walking up and down and things like that. And I even remember in Pakistan, when we were backpacking, the place we were going to stay had closed the youth hostel and we were scared. We didn't know what to do. It was Pakistan. We're at the border of Afghanistan. It was during the Russian war, Afghanistan. So we were right there at the border of Peshawar. And this professor, we were standing there. He says, he spoke English. He goes, what? I said, but there was supposed to be a youth hostel here. And he goes, no, it's gone. It's been gone. And he goes, I said, well, I don't know what to do. We have no place to go. And he says, well, come with me. And he put us in the back of a pickup truck. And we're in the back. We don't know where we're going. Strangers. We have 100 pound backpacks on their back with teddy bears sticking out and and we're getting to a certain point he goes throw the blanket over cover yourself cover yourself and we're like oh, okay we're covering ourselves and he drove us into afghanistan into a compound walled compound and we get out and he says you'll be safe here tonight and they went they said what what do you want to eat and i was scared i mean i've just gotten into a really third world country pakistan we're heading to india and I was scared to drink anything or eat anything. And I said, cookies and oranges. Well, I, I didn't realize how expensive they were. And that family that we were with the kids and the family and, the, and all their, their relatives, and they went out and bought cookies and, and, and or, oranges. And we, it wasn't until we'd left, and, uh, months later, we, I understood what had happened, the value of what they had given us. And they didn't have a lot, believe me. You know, we slept in, in their bedroom. They gave us their bedroom. So the world is a very generous, wonderful place. And just because you have nothing doesn't mean you, you have nothing to give. True. Well, one thing I can say is when it comes to social media and, and all that stuff, all you hear about is all the terrible things in the world. But when you get down to really talking to people in general, most people are, they're, they're good at heart. All of us want to be happy. I mean, all of us want to be stress-free. I mean, unless you're nuts. And you can, you know, I know a lot of nutty people. But, you know, all of us, we want to, listen, I, got, I am so blessed. I look around this, this, this place I live in, Palm Springs, California, and I go, well, days of our lives paid for this. And, and you know, and land of loss paid for that. And, you know, how lucky, I mean, and I'm still alive. I mean, you know, I'm and still still kicking and 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 you know, and still dreaming. Because that's the thing is not to lose the dream. Don't just sit around and you know, I, we were sitting around uh, you know a few years ago, and I go, I can't do, I can't just sit here in the United States. I I got to create something new. So went to Mexico and then create a whole new life in Mexico, and so I'm back and forth. And I, so dreaming, just keep the dream alive. Find something something to help somebody to you know if, if you're depressed go help somebody just i mean i know it's 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 cliches but cliches are reason are, are there because there's there's truth in a cliche well one of the things in the book the secret it talks about is stop focusing on your own problems and start you know helping other people and it takes your mind away from that part of your life you know you're not thinking of the negative stuff you're thinking of other people and before you know it it's turned to positivity i know i remember seeing and i know you've seen it and, and and those experiments with water you know filming water how molecularly water changes when you say wonderful things you say i love you or you're beautiful water mm -hmm. and it all the patterns become uniform in the water you start screaming and yelling at it they become disjointed so there is there's so much we don't know it's just, we are so, you know, we are such a small little species that has just kind of crawled out from the ooze on the, t on the, the timetable. I mean, you, you know, you think of dinosaurs being, you know, 20, 200 million years ago or whatever, whatever it is. You know, gosh, you know, I know dinosaurs because I've actually ridden dinosaurs. I've played with dinosaurs. I've run from dinosaurs. So I'm an expert. And, uh, but, you know, we are just this little, we, we just don't really know hardly anything that's going on, you know. I looked at the, there was a great moon, the blue moon last night, and looked at that beautiful moon, wasn't that extraordinary? I thought, how little we really are. And just just, be, just to be reminded, doesn't mean you have to go there in a dark place, just go, okay, this is the reality. Now, move on. Exactly. Oh, we made moon water the other night too. 
Yes? Yes. What's moon water? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you, you my wife and, and my daughter, they're more into uh, like the, the natural witchy kind of stuff. And right. if you take water on a full moon and you, you take the, the jar out and you set it under the, the where the moon can shine on it, um, it, it absorbs the energy of the moon. And so you, you know, you can like wash your face and hair and stuff and you got to put your intentions into it. Now to me, I mean, I'm not really that much into it, but uh, you know, I, I respect what they do and it, the intention in, that goes into it. You know, it's, it's, it's a symbol to me. It's a, it, well, to me that it's a symbol of, you know, you, you put your intentions into something, but you know, the, the power of the moon, you know, you know, I've always been, Religion, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to backpack around the world is I wanted to study religions. And I did. I lived with the Sikhs, the Hindus, the Muslims, the, the Christians, the Jews, the Jains in, in India. I, I, and I lived with them. And I wanted to study at Rashrams and stuff. And I wanted, because I wanted to find what was true for me. You know, it was Christianity, was, you know, I was, you know, raised Southern Baptist, went to, you know, Presbyterian. And then I, what was, what, what was true anymore in my life? And but I, I always think about the, and I was never Catholic, but Catholic holy water, where they bless the water. And now we know, we know we can film it, that by blessing the water, it actually changes the water mone uh, uh, molecularly. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it's really, it's interesting. And, and I, re I remember, I'm in India, and I've really been searching. And, and I, you know, I, thought, I thought, well, Buddhist was kind of more what I'm into about, about uh, don't pray to one God, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's the universe and I, whatever. I thought, well, that, you know, um, and so we're in India and there was supposed to be, a, there's like seven holy places of Buddha and where he, the different poses, but the one where he puts his hand down, you see the, pho the, the photos, the photos, <laughs> the carvings. Uh, of course, when, when Buddha was alive, you know, Buddha said, make no image of me. And he refused to have, there was no paintings of Buddha. We don't know what he looked like. It was only two years later when the Christians were having, were selling their crosses and everything. They said, oh, well, we better make some money. We better create something. So they did. They, Buddha's face is like a lotus flower and stuff like that. Anyway, so we had heard in India, we were, I forget which town we were in, and there was one of the holy places. And so we paid this rickshaw guy who pulled us on a rickshaw, talking about gratitude. And it was $2 round trip. It was 20 miles away. He pulled us 20 miles one way and 20 miles back the other way. For oh my God. Years. So, so we're going through this thing and I felt I was, I mean, we obviously gave him more money and, uh, but I felt like an ass. I mean, I felt, I, I was so, I was so upset with myself. I felt, I felt so elitist and uh, anyway, so we're passing this little town, it's a dusty town and there's like a little museum. I see a little sign says museum in, 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 uh, in Hindu and then English. I go, oh, let's go over there. So we go in and, and we walk in. It's like, imagine the 1930s uh, display cabinets with, with old, like an old library with dusty shelves and everything's typewritten, you know, what this little thing is and what this little thing is. It's just a little thing. And I remember it changed my life. It was, there was on a tight little handwritten type thing from who knows when. And they were just said, all religions teach the same. The golden rule, do unto others. It's the basis of every religion. And I went, of course. Yep. And and so my you know, Pollyanna do unto others. I mean that is that is that is my mantra. And I you know every time I, I do an action, I think, how would I how would this affect me if I was doing this to somebody? Because I have done things in my life, I will sit that I have regretted, and I will sit in a, a, on a lonely dark night and I'll go why, why why did I do that? I wish I could go back and I, I try to pray it away or I try to, you know, spiritually do whatever to, to make amends for what I've done. And, um, but it haunts me and they become, the, the more I, the more I, 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 I get into that space about not doing harm, the more the harm that I've done. And I, I mean, I'm not talking that I didn't like rudely beat anybody up or anything like that, but whatever things that we've all done in our past, it, they become more magnified, it seems, and I, and I regret them terribly. And I said, okay, I, you know, 
live your life a, 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 in gratitude and, and, and service. And I mean, that, that's just, I mean, that's just what I try to do and I try to do in all my work and, and I try to speak that voice. Well, everything that we do during life, it's, it's, it's a step to, uh, to, to more understanding. When we make mistakes and things like that, if you recognize that it was a mistake and you move on, you, you've learned from that and you don't want to do that again. The, the key is, is to, to, you know, waking up to these things and realizing what you did wrong and that it was wrong. And, you know, like you said, the golden rule, if, if you can do that, if you can treat others like you'd want to be treated, then you can't go wrong. Yeah. I always like to think that reincarnation is real. I, you know, I know that in Bible, it used to have reincarnation. There were, you know, Gregory in the fifth century took a lot of stuff out and rearranged everything. A lot of controversy about that, but I would say, okay, let's just assume, because I, listen, I make no, no pretenses. I know nothing. I, I, you know, I'm just on this planet. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. All I can do is live a great life and be kind as I can be and stuff like that. But I said, if there is reincarnation, then why don't you just work through it in this life, make amends, live a good life, you know? And so if there's not, fine. If there is, then then hopefully you'll reap the benefit of, of that kind of behavior, you know, for me. So, yeah. Well, you, you remember you, you think good thoughts, you speak good words and you do good actions. Right. And I love what you guys are doing with the vibe and, and, and the radios show and stuff like that. I mean, I think it's really a, a really powerful thing, especially in, in, in these times. And it's something that we all need. And, and, you know, I, I find myself, I can't watch the news now. I can't, I, I try to t turn to, to I, I can't even, I can't, I can't watch any show, any movie anymore that somebody's wrongly accused. It, it viscerally makes me, I, I get upset. I, I've become, I, there's so much been going on. So I, I try to watch, okay, I'll go to, I'll go to animated shows. I watched an animated show, a Japanese one about, about the moon and stuff. And suddenly there was some, the mother dies in the first two minutes. I go, no, stop. This is a Bambi, please, please. This is supposed to be animation. I want happy. And fortunately, that, those kind of things don't seem to sell with the, you know, the, the, as a fad, you know, you got to go. They want everything negative, death and you know, destruction. And that that's what sells. And, there's enough of that. We, we need more positivity in this world. Yeah, I, g g give me, give me uh, HGTV. Let, let me see the Property Brothers or somebody. Let's, let's see them take an ugly house and make it pretty at the end. Let's, you know, it's Pygmalion for houses. And I just, <laughs> I just want to, you know, I want a happy ending. I just want a happy ending. You've been talking to my wife, haven't you? Because she makes me watch that every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'll binge watch it. I mean, welcome to COVID. I mean, I, I'll sit here just, you know. But, you know, I love my Judge Judy's. I love my Judge shows because, you know, hopefully there's, there's, there's the, that wrong gets righted at the end. Now, lately, I got to tell you, I'm not so, so, so thrilled with the judges. I think they're making some terrible decisions. But, because I'm, I'm opinionated. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I want... I, 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 I want, I, I want joy. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I literally viscerally cannot, cannot stay in this dark place that, that the world is bombarding us with all the time, all the messages, all the messages, even consumerism, all that stuff, you know, which I'm part of and all, I mean, I, you know, I like it. I enjoy all the perks of everything. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I, it just doesn't work for me emotionally anymore. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I'm very fortunate that I have in a position where I can, I can choose a life. There's a lot of people that don't have that choice and are in the situations where they, they have to, to do certain things. They have to, to work every day. They have to struggle. They've got kids that are ill. They've got family that's, that are ill. They've got, they've got responsibilities that don't allow them to be like so foo-foo and happy and all that kind of stuff. And I get it, believe me, because I've had my share of it too. And so I, I, I'm not trying to say that, you know, it's, I, I, I get that everybody has their own life and their own obstacles and battles. I'm just saying that there's hopefully, hopefully in the darkest of all of our moments, we can look to some other source for light. Yeah, though there's always hope out there. 
you know, the, the person that complains ain't got no shoes is not looking at the person that don't have no feet. You know what I mean? And, and I must say this too, we are a species that are, that is meant for intimacy, not isolation. So to, it, it, I hate the fact that people want to draw this line in the sand and say, if you don't believe like I do, you cannot cross that, that line or we're going to get into it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, and I try to stay away from politics and stuff like that in my shows uh, because there's, there's already enough of that going on. People hear enough of that all the time. You know, I have my opinions, but you know, unless you just want to sit down and discuss them, I'd rather not put it in, you know, out there because I'm, I'm trying to appeal to everyone bringing positivity in. And so let's, let's set aside our differences. Let's sit down and let's have talks like we used to. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, we're all brothers and sisters. We are mm -hmm. all, I mean, it's, it's not even ethereal. It is physiologically. We are all DNA and all that. Mm -hmm. We are part of everyone. And to deny that, to create that separation. I mean, we've always been a warring species. I mean, one of the reasons we've been so survival is, you know, we, we fought and killed and territorial and land and, all, you know, we're you know, we climbed out of the trees or whatever happened, you know, and, and have become a warring species. And, and hopefully, hopefully that gets less and less and less and less, you know, as our time on the planet extends. We can just hope so, you know, think positive. Yes. <laughs> think positive. You got, because it, positivity attracts more positivity. So if you're thinking negative, you're going to attract more negative. Just... That's just the way it is. I agree, Cal. I really agree. But man, this has been awesome. I appreciate you being here, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me spout off, you know. Hey, no, this is your time. You get to talk about what you want to talk about. Yeah. And you're doing Wizard World? Yeah, I'm doing on uh, uh, the 11th and or the, or the 7th and, and then this next Saturday. Uh, uh, Wizard World. Where's it? If you go to wizardworld.com, there's, there's going to be an actual free panel that Kathy Coleman played Holly will be on, and Phil Paley played Chaka. Now Chaka, Phil Paley, of course he was, Phil Paley, when he got the part of Chaka, he was, I think, eight years old. He was the youngest black belt in karate in the United States. Really? So there is, his teacher was Chuck Norris. And there's a clip, and if you, on the Johnny Carson show with Johnny Carson, you can Google it, it is hysterical. If you just Google Johnny Carson, Phil Paley, and Chuck Norris, it'll come up. Where Phil is about, you know, is about, two and a half feet tall in his little white, little white karate outfit with the black belt. And Johnny's this towering above him and Philip flips Johnny over and it's hysterical. And so Philip was on the, the, the Tonight Show and they were, Land of the Lost was starting and they needed a guy to play the monkey. And they were, you know, the, the Crofts used a lot of little people. And, but they saw Philip on the show and thought this guy could do the, physical characters, the monkey stuff. And so they hired Phil and, you know, of course it turned out amazing because he was a great actor because he had to speak Pakuni, that language they created for him, which was a real language at, at UCLA. And it, it, it was, it was amazing. So all these things that maybe has how his appearance on the Tonight Show led to Chaka, you know, leading to a, a whole different world that opened up for him. <laughs> Yeah, I say y'all brought us so much joy and you still are. And I can't thank you enough for that. And you have made my day for sure. Thanks, Kyle. So mine too. Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate you and I appreciate everybody that watches and supports the channel and uh, continue to do so. And we will catch you on the next one. You got it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network and on Instagram at The Vibes Broadcast.